uh, your books. And uh, here we are in 2017, and you wrote a book, Currency Wars. And I wanted to know if the currency wars are now over. Has that passed? Are we past that at this point? Uh, they're not over, but they're uh, th they're morphing a little bit, which is one of the uh, things I talked about in the book. The first point I made uh, in the book, Currency Wars, that came out in 2011, um, is that the world is not always in a currency war. But when it is, the currency war can go on for a very long time, meaning 15, 20 years. And I illustrated that with what I call Currency War One, which lasted from 1921 to 1936, uh, starting with the Weimar hyperinflation, uh, the UK's decision to go back to gold at the wrong price, uh, and the beginnings of the Great Depression. Uh, then I, I talk about Currency War Two, which I date from 1967 to 1987, beginning with the uh, uh, devaluation of pound sterling and the, the first major break in the Bretton Woods system and then continuing through the uh, plaza and the Louvre Accord in the in the mid 1980s. And the point is, uh, currency war one lasted 15 years. Currency war two lasted 20 years. Currency war three began in 2010, uh, partly as a response to the um, uh, not just the financial panic of 2008, but the, uh, the the recession, the technical recession and actually the depression. Uh, that followed. But it uh, here we are in 2017. It's no surprise that seven years later, we're still in this currency war. And I would expect that we'll still be in it two years from now or maybe five years from now because they don't have logical conclusions. It's like a, a, a tennis match, you know, the, the, among equally, you know, talented players. The ball just goes back and forth and back and forth. You know, I devalue, you devalue, I devalue again, you devalue again, etc. cetera. Um, they don't have a logical conclusion except for systemic reform, if, if people actually get together, as they did at Bretton Woods in 1944, or as they did in the Plaza Accord in, in 1985 and the Louvre Accord in 1987, and sit down and agree on what international monetary experts actually call the rules of the game. That's not a made-up phrase. Uh, that's, that's shorthand for, you know, how is the international monetary system supposed to work among the major players? That's what people mean when they say the rules of the game. Right now, there are no rules of the game. Uh, but, uh, and because we're in a currency war, but if you can agree on rules again, that's one way for currency wars to end. The other way they end is with systemic collapse, where things just spin so out of control that people lose confidence in, um, in paper money. They lose confidence in the system. They run to hard assets, uh, gold and silver, obvious ones, but fine art, land, natural resources. Uh, there are many other, um, uh, you know, alternative assets to, to the main currencies. Uh, and that's another uh, another way out. And again, we saw that in um, in the Great Depression. Uh, we also saw it in 1914 at the beginning of uh, World War One when the New York Stock Exchange, for example, was closed for five months. You know, I, I tell people that it's obviously a historical record, but they're shocked to hear that. And uh, you know, 1933, the banks, all every bank in America was closed by executive order. So we have seen these kinds of extreme responses to financial panics before. So you either have systemic reform or systemic collapse. Uh, I don't see any movement towards systemic reform right now. People talk about it. Uh, maybe they wish it would happen, but uh, there's a lot of denial and a lot of self-interest and a lot of self-satisfaction. So I don't really see that momentum that, that may change, but systemic collapse is definitely in the cards. Having said that, going to the, the specifics of your question, where are we in the currency wars? I also made the point in, in my first book that currency wars lead to trade wars and that trade wars end up being shooting wars, uh, kinetic wars. And right now we may, we are seeing definite signs that we're tipping into the trade war phase with, particularly with the Trump administration. Now, just to illustrate that, during the presidential campaign, the 2016 presidential campaign, Trump over and over, you know, railed against China, called China a currency manipulator. He said, you know, when, I'm, when I win, I'm sworn in my day one executive order. We're going to label China currency manipulator. Now, that's not actually how you do it. I mean, they, you can call anyone any, anything you like, but the, the currency manipulation designation comes from the U.S. Treasury. Now, granted, that could be directed by the White House, but it comes from the U.S. Treasury. It, it's actually scheduled for April. Uh, they, there's a, an annual review from the Treasury. It's all laid out by statute, but um, there's no expectation that that's going to happen. So Trump has not followed through on that he's used the rhetoric he actually said germany was a currency manipulator interesting because germany doesn't have a currency they have the euro uh but um so he's throwing the word around but he hasn't actually done anything however trump is dead serious about trade sanctions trade relief and tariffs and the team there you see peter navarro 
Ferraro, um, uh, Jim Lighthizer, the um, uh, Sir Robert Lighthizer, the uh, the U.S. Trade Representative, and um, and uh, Wilbur Ross at the uh, at Secretary of Commerce. They're the troika on trade. So watch Navarro, Wilbur Ross, and Lighthizer. Um, they're so they're going to be pushing back against China, not on the currency front. But on the trade front, it'd be interesting to see what happens with uh, uh, President Xi and, uh, and President Trump uh, meeting in uh, Mar-a-Lago um, next week. So we are seeing signs that uh, currency wars are morphing into trade wars. Having said that, uh, the currency wars are alive and well. Uh, they're being fought by central banks through uh, either easing or tightening and a lot of flip-flopping in the case of the Fed. I expect that will continue. As far as the kinetic war side of it, um, we may see um, the U.S. attack North Korea. I think that's very likely at this point because North Korea shows no signs of uh, uh, steering away from their um, nuclear program, their their effort to uh, basically take their pl- plutonium, highly enriched uranium supplies, weaponize it, ruggedize it, uh, perfect their ICBMs, and be able to uh, launch a nuclear strike on Los Angeles and kill several million Americans. So that that's happening They'll have that capacity within probably four years. Clearly, the United States will not allow that to happen. Uh, and so if uh, and I don't see North Korea being deterred. So the U.S. will probably have to attack North Korea and there are other hot spots around the world. So I think the sequence of currency wars, trade wars, shooting wars is playing out very much as it did in the 1920s and 30s. You mentioned the United States going into North Korea or doing something with North Korea. Are you talking about an invasion? Or are you talking about some type of covert operation to destroy their nuclear facilities? Because won't this, like you said, it's going to kick off a shooting war. I mean, won't Russia, China, won't they step in or say something about it? Well, um, th- th- it won't be an invasion. The last thing anybody wants, I think we learned our lessons in uh uh, Vietnam and the Korean War that, you know, U.S. troops fighting land wars in in Asia is not a good idea. So I think they, the Pentagon's internalized that, but there's no need for that. I think it would be a, a combination of, because uh, war has many dimensions and getting more dimensions all the time as the as the cyber uh, battle space expands. So I would expect, uh, sure, possibility of, of covert operations, sabotage, assassination, the kind of things that were carried out against the Iranians. Um, but also cyber warfare, which was also carried out against the Iranians. Difficult to do, but the ability to penetrate uh, you know, North Korean uh, computer systems, North Korean payment systems, etc. Uh, but then on the kinetic side, you can just use air power and, and you know, sea-based air power. Uh, we have bunker buster bombs, but you might see tactical nuclear weapons uh, uh, for the first time since um, – uh, World War II at Nagasaki and Hiroshima, you might need tactical nuclear weapons to to really destroy the program. You know, it's an old saying in geopolitics, if you're going to kill the king, don't miss. In other words, if you're going to do it, do it. And there's nothing worse than an attempted uh, assassination or attempted decapitation where you fail to do the job and end up being on the wrong side of the pushback. So, so again, I wouldn't rule out the use of tactical nuclear weapons in North Korea, but hopefully that wouldn't be necessary. But the third vector, and this is happening now, is financial warfare. And financial warfare is not just, um, uh, you know, sanctions. It's actually a form of warfare, but you carry it out through financial means. This is what I actually talked about uh, in in, in all of my books, Uh, the first two chapters of Currency Wars, the first two chapters of The Death of Money, which came out in uh, 2014, New York Times bestseller. Uh, and I touch on it again in, in my most recent book, The Road to Ruin. Uh, but that's already happening. Uh, now, interestingly, we had a very tough regime of economic sanctions against North Korea early in the Bush administration. And they were actually working. The, we were putting the, the North Koreans' backs to the wall. Uh, we had we were frozen assets in an entity called Banco Delta Asia, which was a North Korean uh, front, North Korean intermediary. But we backed off from that. Uh, I'm not sure why we didn't want to push that harder. I don't know exactly what threats might have been made behind the scenes. But we, we got some vague promises from North Korea. But then they, by, by late, by 2006 uh, into 2008, those promises were broken. The Obama administration didn't do anything, as far as I can tell. They just punted on the issue. Uh, and now it's been handed off to Trump. So, um, so again, North Korea shows no signs of backing away from that. But we just recently announced 
that North Korea was de-swifted. Now, just to explain that term, SWIFT is the uh, Society for Worldwide um, uh, International uh, Financial Telecommunications. It's the it's the the central nervous system of the global financial system. It's a a system based in Belgium through which all financial message traffic, not not all, but almost all important financial message traffic moves. Um, getting kicked out of SWIFT, and that's what we mean by de-swifting, uh, it's like cutting off oxygen to a patient in intensive care. I mean, they're, they're basically going to be financially strangled. We just did that to North Korea a few weeks ago, and that's only the second time I've seen that. The first time was Iran um, in, uh, in 2012, although that was um, President Obama alleviated that to some extent in 2013 in exchange for Iran agreeing to discuss uh, nuclear weapons and led to this memorandum, which the Trump administration now seems prepared to tear up. So, And we're also putting sanctions back on Iran again after easing up from 2013 to 2016. We're now back in the business of putting sanctions on Iran. So this is the financial warfare space. So you have a special operations, cyber warfare, financial warfare, and combining the two, cyber financial warfare, uh, and then possibly air power, all designed to uh, either deter or degrade uh, the North Korean nuclear program. Now, you mentioned the SWIFT program, and Russia came out with an announcement that they're ready to separate from the SWIFT system. And I know China is also working on a separate payment system. In your view, why are they doing this? Well, because they know it can be used against them, uh, and it is very effective. As I say, it's, you know, like cutting off the oxygen supply uh, is is not, uh, not overstating the metaphor, so to speak. Um, but um, look, we've already put Russian... Uh, sanctions on Russia, but there's a financial war going on between Russia and the United States right now. If you were in a war with the United States, you would fight it aggressively and you would make preparations for worst case scenarios. And by the way, the, the, this announcement, the one you refer to, uh, came from uh, uh, Elvira Nabiolina, who's the uh, head of the Central Bank of Russia. Uh, in my opinion, she's one of the two best central bankers in the world. I would, I would say the other one's Mario Draghi, but uh, head of the ECB, but Mario Draghi and Avila uh, Nabilina, in my view, are the only two central bankers who actually understand central banking. It's very clear that Johnny Yellen and, and before her Ben Bernanke don't understand central banking. They've kind of bumbled through a bunch of, uh, you know, egghead science experiments the last nine years. But Nabilina gets it. And uh, so she's, uh, you know, it's preemptive. She's saying, well, we don't think Russia is going to get kicked out of SWIFT imminently. I don't think they'll get kicked out at all. I mean, there is a there is a kind of a board of governors. There's a governance structure. It's not anything the United States wants. Now, the U.S. has a very, very powerful voice. And before we de-swifted Iran, we kicked Iran out of the dollar payment system. When I say kicked you out. What I mean is we say to all the banks, hey, if you move money for Iran, we're going to kick you out. Well, that's to Credit Suisse or UBS or Deutsche Bank or Citibank or JP Morgan. That's existential. You can't, you would basically be out of business. And so they have to comply and, and they don't always comply. And there have been tons of investigations and multi billion dollar settlements and, you know, deferred prosecution agreements over banks violating some of these, uh, you know, prominently uh, HSBC, but also others. Uh, HSBC seems to be a, a JP Morgan kind of run like criminal organizations, as far as I can tell. But um, so, so we say to the big banks, if you let Iran, uh, in this example, or Russia or North Korea, move money through the system, then we're going to kick you out of the system. And obviously, they, they can't afford to let that happen. So that was easy for the United States because we control the dollar payment system. But you get over to SWIFT, see what Iran did is they said, okay, we can't sell oil for dollars anymore because we can't receive dollars through the payment system. We'll just sell it for euros or Swiss francs or other currencies that you might want. And they could move through SWIFT. So then we kicked Iran out of SWIFT. But to do that, we need the votes of the other members of the board, which are mainly our European allies, uh, you know, Germany, France, UK, uh, and, and some others. Um, and at this point, you sort of need China to to go along as well. So, uh, so I think it's unlikely that Russia would be kicked out. But they're not waiting around to find out the hard way. They're saying, okay, you cut off our oxygen supply. We got a spare oxygen tank over here. And they've built an alternative payment system, and China's doing the same thing. All this, by the way, is very detrimental to the dollar's role as the leading reserve in payments currencies. And I've said this to people in Washington. I do uh, you know, a bit of consulting and uh, meetings with uh, people in the national security space, uh, you know, including you know, government officials, uh, intelligence community, defense department, et cetera. 
uh, Treasury. And I've said to them, I said, you know, look, using our weight, uh, using the dollar as a weapon is extremely powerful. But be careful what you wish for, because the more you throw your weight around, the more people aren't just going to stand for it, the more they're going to build alternative systems. And someday you're going to wake up and find that, you know, you're pushing on a string. You're trying to punish people with uh, dollar specific sanctions and they don't work anymore because no one needs the dollar. We're not there yet, but we're, we're pretty far down that road. So do you think countries like China, Russia, are they dumping uh, treasuries, the dollar? Are they preparing to separate themselves from the dollar? Yes. And the, the, they're doing it several ways. One is reducing their exposure to dollar holdings, not not you know all at once, not dumping them on loss. But if you look at there's something called the Tick Report, uh, which comes out from the Treasury um, periodic. I think it's once a month or it's at least quarterly, but uh, whether it's monthly or quarterly, it's you know it's available on the Treasury website, and it shows foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. And if you look at the official holdings, they are going down significantly, and they have for a while. So. So it is true that uh, China and Russia in particular, but other countries as well, are reducing their holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. Japan has picked up some of the slack um, and U.S. banks as well, but um, but they're reducing. Now, some of that, you know, they don't you don't actually have to sell anything. You just because uh, when the, when a Treasury security matures, if you own a Treasury security and it matures, the Treasury just sends you the money. They, they give you your money back. Basically, it's like paying off a loan. Well, so you don't actually have to sell anything. You just have to sit there and do nothing, and your holdings will go down as long as you don't reinvest uh, in more treasuries. Uh, and that's what's happening. They're reinvesting in euros. They're reinvesting in other securities. So this is kind of going on quietly and slowly without a major dumping operation, which which the U.S. could stop. By, uh, the president has the authority to stop that if it ever became malicious. But what they are doing is buying gold. Now, China um, – I'll separate the official numbers from what we actually think is going on. The official numbers are they've tripled their gold reserves in the last uh, 11 years. So from 2006 to 2017, they have officially gone from about 600 tons to about 1,800 tons of gold. But China is non-transparent uh, based on mining output, Hong Kong exports, Swiss exports, et cetera. There's good reason to believe that China's gold holdings are actually – more in the order of 3,000 or 4,000 tons, perhaps even higher. I've heard some reports that they're a lot higher. Russia's more transparent, uh, but they have um, tripled their gold reserves as well uh, just in the past um, eight years. So they've gone from 600 tons to about 1,800 tons. So if gold is not a monetary asset, if gold is you know, a barbarous relic, as the, as the uh, critics like to say, why have Russia and China – tripled their gold reserves in the last, as I say, between five and 10 years approximately, and uh, and continue to buy more gold every month. Uh, Russia's buying 20, 30 tons a month, sometimes more, sometimes less, but that's kind of been the, the, the run rate. Uh, are they stupid or do they see something that most people don't? Well, I guarantee they're not stupid. I've been to Moscow and Beijing, Shanghai, and met with officials there, and they're very, very savvy. So clearly, they see something that most investors don't see, and they're getting ready for this, um, you know, collapse of confidence in the dollar. It doesn't mean we won't have dollars. It doesn't mean the dollar goes away. But what it does mean is that the dollar, very quickly and unexpectedly, almost loses its status as the benchmark global reserve currency to be replaced, probably by the IMF special drawing right. But you know, if not. Uh, some new gold back currents. In your book, Road to Ruin, uh, you mentioned the financial crisis. And part of your book says the next financial crisis will not be merely a bigger version of 1998 and 2008 crisis. It will be qualitatively different. It will encompass multiple asset classes on a global scale. How big is this going to be? Uh, it looks like an extinction level event. I mean, bigger than anything that's ever happened before. And let, let me explain why I say that because it's, you know, I don't, I don't like to make claims without backing them up with, with uh, you know, science or history or facts or, you know, some combination of those things. Um, when I make that point, uh, there's sort of two factors. One is I, I look at a tempo or sequence of prior financial crises. And in particular, I focus on 1998. That was the Russia long-term capital management crisis, which actually started in Asia the year before. Uh, and then I look at 2008 that was, you know, called the Lehman Brothers crisis or whatever you like. Um, and which also started the year before in 2007 with um, some mortgage uh, uh, defaults uh, uh, announced at Bear Stearns and HSBC and elsewhere. So those are the two case studies I have. And then I just I take that 10 year tempo from 1998 to 2008 and I just take it out 10 years. And it's just a convenience. 
uh, to maintain the 10-year tempo and talk about 2018, except I make the point that it could be tomorrow. I mean, don't don't think that you can just sort of put your feet up until 2018. If it's even then, uh, this is something that could happen tomorrow. But but here's the point. 1998, and by the way, I was counsel of long-term capital management. I negotiated that bailout. I was in the room with Fed and Treasury officials. We were on the phone to Tokyo. I know exactly what was going on behind the scenes there. We were just hours away from closing every major market in the world, stock markets and bond markets, uh, at least temporarily to deal with the panic that would have ensued because it wasn't really about long-term capital management. I mean, it's a hedge fund, right? If, if we had filed for bankruptcy in the Cayman Islands, which we were fully prepared to do, uh, I'd like to say I would have just slept in the next day. You know, there would have would have been nothing much for us to do. But but our $1.3 trillion of derivatives exposure would have suddenly been flipped back to Wall Street. They were counterparties in all that trade. Well, if you have a two-sided position, which they do because they're intermediaries, and one side goes away, all of a sudden you have a one-sided position. So you have to go out and sell that security. So it would have been massive sales of stocks and bonds, more than the market could absorb, and that would have been a panic. So Wall Street didn't bail out long-term capital management. They bailed out themselves by taking over the balance sheet and doing an orderly unwind. So that's what happened then. In 2008, same thing. We were just days away from the sequential collapse of every major bank in the world. So Bear Stearns collapsed in March 2008. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the giant mortgage agencies, collapsed in June of 2008. Lehman Brothers collapsed on September 15, 2008. Morgan Stanley would have been a few days later, then Goldman, then Citi, then B of A, and all those dominoes would have fallen. Again, massive intervention um, to the tune of tens of trillions of dollars of currency swaps, guarantees, et cetera, to prevent that from getting worse. So two times we came within hours or days away from collapsing the entire global financial system. Didn't happen because of intervention. But look at the intervention. In, two th in, sorry, in 1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street. In 2018, who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, each crisis gets bigger than the one before. Each bailout gets bigger than the one before. We are now at the point where the next crisis will be so large it will exceed the capacity even of the central banks to do the bailout. And so the, the, the resolution, the liquidity injection that you always need, because these panics are always about liquidity. Everybody wants their money back. Uh, you know, people say, uh, you know, there's actually a, there's a global dollar shortage going on right now. That's, that's one of the reasons why China's uh, selling treasuries, by the way, not just to get out of dollars, but because they actually need dollars um, to prop up their own currency because of this global dollar shortage. And people say, well, how can there be a global dollar shortage? The Fed printed $4 trillion. Its balance sheet is over $4 trillion. The answer is that, yeah, the Fed created $4 trillion of printed money, but the world created $100 trillion of debt. Well, there's been no deleveraging since 2008. The biggest banks are bigger. They have a, a higher percentage of the banking assets of uh, the entire system. Their derivatives books are larger, leverage is greater, debt to GDP ratios are higher. Everything that was too big to fail and unstable in 2008 is bigger, more unstable, more prone to failure today. And just to kind of round out that the discussion, when you use complexity theory, which is the branch of science that I use to build these models, and and the central banks do not use them, they're they're using obsolete uh, stochastic general equilibrium models. But when you use complexity theory, one of the things you learn from complexity theory is very sound science, is that the worst thing that can happen in a system, uh, the worst collapse, is an exponential function of scale. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying that the risk goes up faster than the size of the system. So when you double the system, you don't double the risk, you increase it by a factor of 10 or more. So I just explained why we vastly increased the size of the system measured by bank assets, concentration, derivatives, leverage, et cetera, which means that the risk has gone up even more, which is why I say the next panic will be a, an extinction level event. It could happen tomorrow. I'm not saying it will happen tomorrow. I'm saying it could happen tomorrow. There's nothing the central banks can do to stop it. You're going to have to lock down the system, which I talk about in my book, The Road to Ruin. I explain exactly how that will play out. And then you're going to have to have some rescue, whether it's special drawing rights, which is the IMF world money or gold or, or something else 
if you if you want to unlock the system. Do the central banks, do they realize that we're coming to a point where this whole thing cannot be sustained? Are they working together to maybe collapse the system? I don't think they're trying to collapse the system. I think they are aware that a lot of these risks that, that we're talking about are there, uh, but they don't fully comprehend it. Now, let me explain what I, what I mean by that. Um, they, um, the central bankers ran the bailout the last time. They know what they did. Uh, they know more than we do. And, uh, although a lot of information has come out, but the main point that I make is they have not, they've, they've been unable to normalize things since then. For example, prior to the crisis in 2008, the Federal Reserve balance sheet was about $800 billion. In the course of trying to mitigate the crisis, they increased the balance sheet to over $4 trillion and they cut interest rates to zero and held them there for seven years. Now, if somehow they had got the balance sheet back to 800 billion or even a trillion and got interest rates up to two, two and a half percent, which is what the Taylor rule says they should be, I'd be the first one to congratulate them. I'd say, nice job, guys. You know, you saved the world and you got back to normal. But that didn't happen. They're, they're still at $4 trillion. Interest rates are, you know, okay, they've crept, you know, crept up to uh, uh, three quarters of 1%, but they're still well below where they would be at the stage of the business cycle. Um, so they have not been able to normalize their balance sheet and they have not been able to get interest rates back to where they want. So what are they going to do if the crisis hit tomorrow? Take the balance sheet to 8 trillion, 12 trillion? I mean, what's the, what's the boundary? Well, legally there is no boundary. They could in fact do that, but in my view, that's not sustainable. And they know it. there's an invisible confidence boundary. There's a point at which people are saying, you know, this is crazy. I'm out of here. Uh, I, I no longer have confidence in the dollar, uh, whether it's foreign creditors, U.S. citizens, people just run to the alternatives and we know what they are. It's gold, silver, land, fine art, natural resources, hard assets of various kinds um, or Switzerland or, you know, take your pick. But they're out of the dollar. Uh, and, and so I think the central bank has an intuition about that, even though they're not using the same models I'm using. Um, and so what they've done uh, to address this instability and this risk is called uh, macro prudential regulation. It's another one of these geeky terms they come up with. But for example, they've increased capital requirements from you know, roughly 4% up to 8%, sometimes higher. Uh, is that a bad thing? Well, it's not a bad thing, but it's not enough. The thing about bank capital, uh, unless it's 50% or 100%, that's different. But when you're talking about going from 4% to 8%, if you don't need the capital, you can have almost zero. If you do need the capital, no amount is enough. In other words, in, in a steady state, when everyone's confident and everyone thinks the banks are fine, you actually don't need that much capital. But when there's a panic and everybody wants their money back and you do need the capital, 8% is no better than 4%. It might buy you another couple of weeks before the bank goes to zero. But the point is it's going to zero very quickly at an accelerating rate. And so that kind of regulation, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying it's not really going to work and it's not enough. The other big thing they did uh, at the G20 summit in Brisbane, Australia in November 2014 is they came up with what I call the Brisbane rules, um, where they explicitly said that going forward, our policy in bailouts is going to be no more bailouts. We're going to have bail-ins. Now, what's the difference between a bailout and a bail-in? Well, a bail, and they all have to do with resolving, uh, you know, large, too big to fail bank distress and too big to fail potential failures. How, how do you deal with that? Well, the bail-in model, uh, sorry, the bail, uh, the bail-out model, which we saw in 2008, is you, you use taxpayer money, you use guarantees, you use money printing, you use government to prop up the bank. Uh, no bondholder of any major bank took a penny of loss in 2008, not one. Every one of those banks got bailed out. Every one of those bonds got paid off at maturity, or, or at least there are still uh, good debts on the on the books of the banks. Not one depositor lost a penny in any of those banks. The tax, the bailout was fully funded by the U.S. taxpayers. Even stockholders lost, the, the value of the stock went down, but it came back again, you know, since then to, to some extent. So uh, there was no pain by any stakeholder, meaning stockholders, bondholders, and depositors. All the pain was felt by taxpayers and ordinary citizens in the form of uh, not getting paid for the risk and also zero interest rate policy, which meant that, you know, trillions of dollars of lost income on savings has been transferred to the banks in the form of zero interest rates because the banks don't have to pay you interest. So that's the bail out. Brisbane, uh, 2014, they said, for now we're going to have bail-ins. The way a bail-in works is that when a bank's in distress, 
The first loss is going to fall on the equity holders. Equity holders are going to go to zero. You're going to get wiped out. Then uh, bond holders are going to take a haircut. So look at the hole in the balance sheet and maybe you'll get 50 cents on the dollar or 70 cents on the dollar, but you won't get 100 cents on the dollar. And then finally, depositors will not be protected above the insured amount. So let's say uh, FDIC insurance, $250,000 in Europe, it's about 100,000 euros. Um, that, uh, that, that amount will be backed up, backstopped, but anything in excess of that, you're at risk. And so the depositors, bondholders, and stockholders will all suffer only, only after all of those resources have been exhausted would any taxpayer money be used. So that's the so-called bail-in. Now, on the face of it, it sounds fair, it sounds reasonable, it sounds equitable. Why not put the losses where they belong in the hands of the people who benefit and the people who had the upside? Uh, and why go to the taxpayers? Sounds good. The problem is, in practice, they haven't lived up to it. And we have concrete examples. In the case of uh, Italy, uh, and, and pardon my Italian, it's not very good, but the Banco di Monte I Paschi di Siena, uh, BMP, um, uh, oldest bank in Italy, definitely a too big to fail bank, that's being bailed out by the Italian government because they don't want to face the political pain of having to put losses on bondholders who happen to be voters, by the way. Well, Angela Merkel was outraged by this. You know, Chancellor of Germany, she turned to the Italian prime minister at the time, uh, uh, Renzi, and said, you can't do this. Remember, we agreed no more bailouts. We only have bail-ins. Renzi did it. Well, Renzi's gone now. He lost the election in December. But uh, the, the new Italian government of technocrats is, in fact, bailing out that bank. But what Renzi did, Renzi turned to Merkel and said, oh, yeah, we can't do bailouts. Well, what are you going to do with Deutsche Bank? And it was, that's a much bigger bank. That They're in distress. They're insolvent. They're going to need a rescue. And uh, are you seriously going to apply the bail-in rules to Deutsche Bank uh, and let German working people suffer losses on their deposits just because they're more than 100,000 euros? So, so the point is, bail-in sounds fine in theory, but it's not lived up to in practice because of the politics. So there really are no solutions on the table. Bank capital is never enough. Bail-in is not being respected in practice. Um, meanwhile, the system keeps getting bigger, more unstable. And so when the crash comes, they're going to have to go to what I call, what I talk about in my book, The Road to Ruin, the ICE-9 uh, solution. What is the ICE-9 solution? What, what do you mean by that? The ICE-9 is a phrase I, I borrowed from uh, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, one of my favorite authors. He wrote a book in the early 1960s called Cat's Cradle, which I highly recommend. It's very funny, dark, dark, uh, dark comedy, but a, but a very funny book, short, easy to read. Um, but in that book, he invented something called ICE-9. There was a, was a scientist uh, who created ICE-9. ICE-9 is a polymorph or a similar molecule to water, to H2O, with two important differences. Number one, the uh, melting temperature is 114 degrees Fahrenheit, which means it's frozen at room temperature. And number two, when a molecule of H2O, H2O water comes in contact with a molecule of ice nine, the water turns to ice nine, which is ice basically. So at, at room temperature. So, uh, so he took this ice nine, put it molecule, put it in vials, three vials, gave it to his three children. And the plot of the book has to do with whether any of them open it and pour it. If you pour the ice nine into a stream, the stream freezes, then the, the harbor freezes, then the ocean freezes and all the water on the earth freezes and life on earth dies. In other words, it's a doomsday machine. And I take that, that story and bring it over to financial markets as a metaphor. And I make the point that the panic is going to start somewhere. There'll be some catalyst. It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, people ask me all the time, what's going to start the panic? And I say, it doesn't matter. The system is unstable. It's prone to collapse. So whether it's a financial failure, an assassination, a coup d'etat, a natural disaster, um, you know, it could be a lot of things, but it, it won't matter. It'll just happen, but it'll, show up it'll emerge in a particular segment of the of the capital markets and i my number one suspect would be money market funds because they're supposed to be liquid they're not really it's a it's a great misnomer uh, people think money market funds are money they're not but people will call up for the money market funds and say i want to redeem my shares you know wire the money to my bank account and do it now um, and what they're going to find is that, you know, well, what's on the other side of the money market funds? Well, there are all kinds of short-term liabilities, and they're not going to be able to roll those over. So they're going to suspend redemptions on the money market funds. By the way, that was not the law in 2008. It was you could not suspend redemptions. There was no provision for that. Today there is. They changed that law, so you can suspend redemptions. So it's like a hedge fund that puts up gates uh, and it closes the gates. 
So, um, so then people say, oh, gee, I can't get my money out of my uh, money market fund. Well, I better take the money I do have out of the bank. So they're going to have to close the banks. And we program the ATM so you can only get $300 a day for gas and groceries. And people say, oh, well, gee, money market funds close, banks close. I'll sell my stocks. We're well, going to have to close the stock market. In other words, it's going to go from sector to sector the same way the Einstein molecule spreads exponentially to freeze all the water in the world. And eventually, you're going to have to lock down the entire financial system. Now, they'll tell you it's temporary. And like I say, they'll pro you'll probably be able to get a couple hundred bucks a day for gas and groceries from the ATM while they're working on a solution. The solutions being the ones we mentioned earlier, which are you know, uh, re resetting or rebooting the international monetary system, uh, new rules of the game, um, SDR, liquidity, maybe a gold standard, maybe a hybrid gold-backed SDR, but whatever it is, these things will take months to work out. And in the meantime, you're going to have this ICE-9 solution. I, I talk about this in a lot of detail in my book. And by the way, yeah, there, there are 151 footnotes, uh, actually not footnotes, they're endnotes. Uh, they're notes, but they, they come at the end. So you can, you don't have to read them if you don't want to as you're going through the book. But everything I'm describing, uh, is documented, backed up, supported either by science, I've, you know, put the equations in the end notes or official documents, statements. You can find it all. None of it is, um, fantasized. None of it is, uh, you know, Jules Verne, science fiction, it's its all happening. It, it's, it's already happened to some extent. We've seen it in Cyprus. We've seen it in Greece. We saw it in India with demonetization. Um, you know, you, Europe uh, got rid of the 500 euro no. This is all part of the war on cash. The war on cash is designed ultimately to eliminate cash, to force everyone into uh, all their wealth into digital form. Um, and I like to make the point that, you know, before you slaughter cattle, you have to herd them into a pen. And before you slaughter investors, you have to herd them into a digital pen at one of these you know, major banks. And once all the wealth is digital, it can be frozen, locked down, confiscated, taxed, monitored, et cetera. Uh, so, but, but before you do that, you have to eliminate cash, and that's exactly what's going on. So we're already seeing ICE-9 in, in, in small ways, and it, it'll get worse. How long do you think this will last, uh, you know, when the, when the whole financial system goes dark? How long will people suffer through this? Well, you know, one day it seems like a long time when you can't get yes. your money. But uh, let's look at historical examples. And by the way, I also make the point, <clears throat> everything, I, I, as I said, everything I described is backed up by official sources or science. But everyone, I also make the point, every one of these things has happened before. So uh, the New York Stock Exchange was closed from July to December 1914. And it was a global financial panic at the time. Five months, the New York Stock Exchange was closed. People actually went out on the street, on New Street, and they, they traded shares by hand, you know, cash, you know, bring, bring your cash, bring your shares and sign them over. Uh, it was called the curb exchange. Um, in 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt shut every bank in America by executive order, just said every bank is closed. He didn't say when they would reopen. Uh, in fact, they, they, they did reopen about eight days later, but nobody knew when they were going to reopen. That was before the days of ATMs, obviously. You couldn't get your money. In the Great Depression, there was such a shortage of money that people invented uh, wooden money. It was called the wooden nickel. You know, I was a kid. There was an expression, don't take any wooden nickels. But in the 1930s, small communities would create wooden money and you would use it for local merchants and everybody would trade it with each other because it's all the money they had. Uh, they made money out of wood. Um, so the point is all these things have happened before. Now, I would expect that, well, I mean, we, again, we have another concrete example. I, I make the point, none of this is speculation. In 2009, in response to the panic, the IMF did issue special drawing rights in August 2009. <clears throat> Pardon me, people said, where did these special drawing rights come from? And they knew, no, they've been around since 1969. Uh, so they've been around for, uh, you know, almost 50 years. And um, they have been issued from time to time, usually associated with market panics and liquidity crises. The last time they were issued was August 2009. Now, that panic, the acute stage of that panic was September 2008. That's when Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. So it took 11 months to issue the SDRs. Well, even if you put that on an accelerated timeline, uh, next time because the panic will be worse. I don't see how you could do it in less than, you know, I'll guess, but five months or six months. Uh, certainly a new international monetary order. You know, Bretton Woods, the, the actual meeting at Bretton Woods just took a few weeks in uh, uh, June 1944. 
but they've been working on it for two years, um, Britain and the UK in particular, under the direction of Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt, have been working on it for two years. So these things can't be done overnight. Uh, but even on a crash basis, if it took, no pun intended, but if it took uh, three to six months, that's a long time for the system to be shut down. But I think that's a reasonable forecast. What will the United States look like after this? I mean, uh, you're talking about SDRs. Will a dollar still be in existence? Will we still have our way of life? Will everything go back to normal? Probably not. Um, the, I think the dollar will still be in existence, but it'll be a local currency, not the benchmark global reserve currency. I would expect the new benchmark global reserve would be the special drawing right or, or maybe gold or new gold back currency or gold linked SDR uh, or else we'll just the whole system will splinter and we'll have autarky and every country will you know be on its own with its own currency and uh, globalization will uh, you know kind of grind to a halt. Uh, but uh, you know the, we'll still have dollars but it'll be a local currency if I go to Turkey Today, I'm going to get some Turkish lira, and if I go to Mexico, I'm going to get some Mexican pesos. Well, if you come to the United States, you'll want some dollars, but it won't be used for the big things, you know, uh, settlement of balance of payments, reserve positions of major countries, payment for oil, um, you know, things of that type, direct foreign investment. That would all be done, I would expect, either in SDRs or a new gold-backed uh, SDR of some kind. As far as life, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I say, if you want to know what's going to happen in four, year, four years, read my books. But if you want to re know what's going to happen in 30 years, uh, there's an author named um, Lionel Shriver. She's a novelist, very accomplished, well-known novelist. But, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, fiction writers come closer to the truth than the economists. Uh, you know, everything from Isaac Asimov, uh, you know, 2001 to, uh, uh, Ju you know, Jules Verne and others, they've done a pretty good job of predicting the future. But she's a novel. She has a book called The Mandibles, uh, which I highly recommend. Great novel just on its own. But uh, it's it's about life in a post-financial collapse world. And the point is, life goes on. I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's not like getting hit by uh, an asteroid. But it's different. So it, it's not the end of the world, but it's the end of the world as we know it. And, you know, people still go to the store, but, you know, there, there's – Crime is rampant, and if you want police protection, you have to pay for it. And you get to the store, they have certain things, not others. Um, and, you know, property is run down, and, you know, people are moving in with each other. And, you know, people who used to be rich are suddenly poor, and how do they adjust to that? I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to don't want to give a spoiler alert. But, um, but if you want to – and I'm not saying it's, it's going to play out exactly that way. That's not my point. My point is if you want a, a very – realistic portrayal of what life could be like in a post financial collapse world uh that's the best i've seen and uh so and i highly recommend it how can people prepare for this i mean some people say gold some people say silver some people say bitcoin what's your take on this and how to prepare and protect your wealth well i say gold and silver and, and a few other assets but my, my advice is to put 10% of your investable assets in gold and 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 silver as well. Um, silver has a very practical application. Look, it's a precious metal. I don't spend as much time thinking about silver as I do about gold. And the reason is that gold is, in my view, money. It's the ultimate form of money. It's, it's not just a monetary asset. It's the only form of money that I think really works in the long run. Uh, and so you should definitely have gold. Um, but I recommend 10%. Uh, when I say investable assets, uh, I would exclude, you know, your home equity and your business equity. So don't don't gamble with your home. Don't leverage up your house to go out and buy gold. And a lot of people have some kind of business equity. You're uh, you're an auto dealer, a dry cleaner, pizza parlor operator, a lawyer, doctor, dentist, whatever it may be. Um, you've got some business equity. Leave that to one side. So exclude your home equity and your business equity. Whatever's left. Those are your investable assets, and I recommend 10% of your investable assets in gold and silver. And the reason 10% is that if if I'm wrong, and obviously I don't think I am, but if I am, you're not going to get hurt with a 10% allocation. But if I'm right, that's going to go up so much that it will, in effect, be your insurance against bad things happening in other parts of your portfolio. Um, and the, the practical aspect of silver, if you're just trying to preserve wealth, in an age of uh, you know collapse and ultimate hyperinflation, uh, gold will do a better job of that than silver. 
But it might get to the point, which which you do see in, in the mandibles and, and I see, which is where you're going to have to go out and get groceries for your family. You know, And, and the, the banks are shut down. The ATMs are shut down. Uh, and people say, well, you know, one of the one of the criticisms of gold is, you know, well, what am I supposed to do with an ounce of gold? Uh, you know, I want fifty dollars worth of groceries, and I got a one thousand two hundred fifty dollar coin to shave off a little bit, you know, buy a gram or whatever. Well, no, just use silver. Um, and uh, so, an ounce of silver will get you a day or a couple of days worth of groceries, and it'll have, it'll be believe me, people will take it in the in the scenarios we're describing. So, I recommend um, uh, you know, American Gold Eagles. Uh, uh, is a is a good way to own gold. Uh, you know, if you're a billionaire, maybe you want some bars uh, uh, in a safe place. But and I recommend American Silver Eagles. They're they're, they're from, you know there are other good coins around the world, Maple Leafs and um, and others. People, some people like these Austrian Philharmonic. By the way, I'm not a gold dealer, so this is this is uh, this is how to preserve wealth. This is financial analysis. I'm not I'm not selling anyone gold coins, uh, but but I do recommend them as a way to uh, to preserve wealth. Beyond that. Um, I would have an allocation in cash, and people are surprised to hear me say that. They're like, wait a second, Jim. You're the guy talking about the death of money, uh, the, the lockdown, ICE-9. Uh, why would I want cash? The answer is you might not w- want it for long or forever, but it's good in the short run. I These things can happen quickly, but I don't think it will come totally out of the blue. We'll have some forewarning and some ability to pivot. So for now, cash is uh, – I think people underestimate the uh, – the value of the embedded optionality, the person with cash can pivot into either maybe more gold and silver, or some other asset class as we get nearer to this, uh, this extinction level event. And, and, and land, uh, fine art, uh, these are all things that, uh, you know, will preserve wealth and will, will do very well. So, uh, so gold, silver, land, fine art, you know, perhaps natural resources, investments in private equity, you know, venture capital startup companies where you actually know the entrepreneur, you're not relying you're not relying on a digital payment system to to secure your wealth. You actually have a paper contract with somebody you know, uh, and then that that can have some value. As far as Bitcoin is concerned, um, I don't own any Bitcoin. I don't recommend it. And of course, that's enough to get you branded as a Neanderthal by the by the Bitcoin uh, groupies, as I call them. But um, I, I I believe that blockchain technology clearly has a future. I mean, remember, Bitcoin is just one cryptocurrency based on blockchain technology. So I think you need to separate the two. Uh, I'm not a technophobe. I get it. I read all the technical papers on this. I've actually worked with U.S. Special Operations Command in trying to interdict ISIS use of cryptocurrency. So I know more about it than a lot of Bitcoin people actually. But um, but so the blockchain technology, I think, is here to stay. Um, but Bitcoin itself, you know, it came out in 2009. We have not had an economic downturn since Bitcoin was invented. So we don't know how it performs in the business cycle. I, I can estimate how, you know, dollars, euros, gold, stocks, bonds, all those assets have been through multiple um, business cycles. So we have some basis for thinking about how they perform, but we have no basis for understanding how Bitcoin performs in uh, an actual recession or a financial panic because there hasn't been one since it was in Venice. That to me, that's by itself. That's one reason not to uh, be too. Uh, Pollyannish about uh, Bitcoin as a, as a store of wealth. I do sympathize, however, with people in um, repressive uh, regimes trying to get their money out. I mean, that's not easy. And so uh, you see it in China a lot, people using Bitcoin to get their money out of China um, and, you know, and elsewhere around the world, maybe Venezuela and some other places. So to the extent you can put your, uh, you know, keep your brain wallet in your brain and get to Bitcoin and get on a plane and come someplace and maybe turn it back into uh, an asset free of uh, the grasp of uh, the, the failing jurisdiction. I, I think it, it does have a, a place to facilitate uh, um, capital flight. James, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work and, and get your books? Thank you. Uh, the books are all available on Amazon uh, and uh, Barnes & Noble online and major bookstores. My most recent book is The Road to Ruin. But also uh, right now, as we're doing this, I have – uh, the, the paperback edition of The Death of Money is just out. Now, that book came out in 2014, but first of all, it's still very fresh. Uh, you know, it talks about a lot of things that are going on today, but there's a new preface. I've added new material, including some never-before-published information on insider trading ahead of the 9-11 attacks. So, so there's new stuff in there, and uh, people may be interested in that. Uh, Currency Wars and the New Case for Gold, uh, all available online. Um, I'm very active on Twitter. 
My Twitter handle is at James G. Rickards, R-I-C-K-A-R-D-S, at James G. Rickards. And my uh, official website is the thejamesrickardsproject.com. Thank you very much once again for being on the spotlight. I really appreciate it. They're going down significantly, and they have for a while. So, so it is true that uh, China and Russia in particular, but other countries as well, are reducing their holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. Japan has picked up some of the slack, um, and U.S. banks as well. But, um, but they're reducing now. Some of that, you know, they don't. You don't actually have to sell anything. You just because. Uh, See, when, when a treasury security matures, if you own a treasury security and it matures, the treasury just sends you the money. They, they give you your money back, basically. It's like paying off a loan. Well, so you don't actually have to sell anything. You just have to sit there and do nothing, and your holdings will go down as long as you don't reinvest uh, in more treasuries. Uh, and that's what's happening. They're reinvesting in euros. They're reinvesting in other securities. So this is kind of going on quietly and slowly without a major dumping operation, which which the U.S. could stop by – uh, the president has the authority to stop that if it ever became malicious. But what they are doing is buying gold. Now, China, um, I'll, I'll separate the official numbers from what we actually think is going on. The official numbers are they've tripled their gold reserves in the last uh, 11 years. So from 2006 to 2017, they have officially gone from about 600 tons to about 1,800 tons of gold. But China is non-transparent uh, based on Mining output, Hong Kong exports, Swiss exports, et cetera. There's good reason to believe that China's gold holdings are actually more in the order of 3,000 or 4,000 tons, perhaps even higher. I've heard some reports that they're a lot higher. Russia's more transparent, uh, but they have um, tripled their gold reserves as well uh, just in the past um, eight years. So they've gone from 600 tons to about 1,800 tons. So if gold is not a monetary asset, if gold is you know, a barbarous relic, as the, as the uh, critics like to say, why have Russia and China tripled their gold reserves in the last, as I say, between five and 10 years approximately, and, uh, and continue to buy more gold every month? Uh, Russia's buying 20, 30 tons a month, sometimes more, sometimes less, but that's kind of been the, the, the run rate. Uh, are they stupid or do they see something that most people don't? Well, I guarantee they're not stupid. I've been to Moscow and Beijing, Shanghai, and met with officials there, and they're very, very savvy. So clearly they see something that most investors don't see, and they're getting ready for this um, you know, collapse of confidence in the dollar. It doesn't mean we won't have dollars. It doesn't mean the dollar goes away. But what it does mean is that the dollar very quickly and unexpectedly almost loses its status as the benchmark global reserve currency to be replaced probably by the IMF special drawing right, but, you know, if not, uh, some new gold-backed currency. In your book, Road to Ruin, uh, you mentioned the financial crisis, and part of your book says the next financial crisis will not be merely a bigger version of 1998 and 2008 crisis. It will be qualitatively different. It will encompass multiple asset classes on a global scale. How big is this going to be? Uh, it looks like an extinction level event. I mean, bigger than anything that's ever happened before. And let, let me explain why I say that because it's, you know, I don't, I don't like to make claims without backing them up with, with uh, you know, science or history or facts or, you know, some combination of those things. Um, when I make that point, uh, there's sort of two vectors. One is I, I look at a tempo or sequence of prior financial crises. And in particular, I focus on 1998. That was the Russia long-term capital management crisis, which actually started in Asia the year before. Uh, and then I look at 2008, that was you know called the Lehman Brothers crisis or whatever you like, um, and which also started the year before in 2007 with um, some mortgage uh, uh, defaults uh, uh, announced at Bear Stearns and HSBC and elsewhere. So those are the two case studies I have. And then I just I take that 10-year tempo from 1998 to 2008. And I just take it as case scenarios. And by the way, the, the, this announcement, the one you refer to, uh, came from uh, uh, Elvira Nabiolina, who's the uh, head of the Central Bank of Russia. Uh, in my opinion, she's one of the two best central bankers in the world. I would, I would say the other one's Mario Draghi, but uh, head of the ECB. But Mario Draghi and Elvira Nabiolina, in my view, are the only two central bankers who actually understand central banking. It's very clear that Johnny Yellen and, and before her Ben Bernanke don't understand central banking. They've kind of bumbled through a bunch of, uh, you know, egghead science experiments the last nine years. But Nabilena gets it. And uh, so she's, uh, you know, it's preemptive. She's saying, well, we don't think Russia is going to get kicked out of SWIFT imminently. I don't think they'll get kicked out at all. 
I mean, there is a there is a kind of a board of governors. There's a governor structure. It's not anything the United States wants. Now, the U.S. has a very, very powerful voice. And before we de-swifted Iran, we kicked Iran out of the dollar payment system. When I say kick you out. What I mean is we say to all the banks, hey, if you move money for Iran, we're going to kick you out. Well, that's to Credit Suisse or UBS or Deutsche Bank or Citibank or JP Morgan. That's existential. You can't, you would basically be out of business. And so they have to comply and, and they don't always comply. And there have been tons of investigations and multi billion dollar settlements and, you know, deferred prosecution agreements over banks violating some of these, uh, you know, prominently uh, HSBC, but also others. Uh, HSBC seems to be a, a JP Morgan kind of run like criminal organizations, as far as I can tell. But um, so, so we say to the big banks, if you let Iran, uh, in this example, or Russia or North Korea move money through the system, then we're going to kick you out of the system. And obviously, they, they can't afford to let that happen. So that was easy for the United States because we control the dollar payment system. But you get over to SWIFT, see what Iran did is they said, okay, we can't sell oil for dollars anymore because we can't receive dollars through the payment system. We'll just sell it for euros or Swiss francs or other currencies that you might want. And they could move through SWIFT. So then we kicked Iran out of SWIFT. But to do that, we need the votes of the other members of the board, which are mainly our European allies, uh, you know, Germany, France, UK, uh, and, and some others. Um, and you, at this point, you sort of need China to to go along as well. So, uh, so I think it's unlikely that Russia would be kicked out. But they're not waiting around to find out the hard way. They're saying, okay, you cut off our oxygen supply. We got a spare oxygen tank over here. And they've built an alternative payment system, and China's doing the same thing. All this, by the way, is very detrimental to the dollar's role as the leading reserve in payments currencies. And I've said this to people in Washington. I do uh, you know, a bit of consulting and uh, meetings with uh, people in the national security space, uh, you know, including you know, government officials, uh, intelligence community, defense department, et cetera, uh, treasury. And I've said to them, I said, you know, look, Using our weight, uh, using the dollar as a weapon is extremely powerful, but be careful what you wish for because the more you throw your weight around, the more people aren't just going to stand for it, the more they're going to build alternative systems. And someday you're going to wake up and find that you know, you're know you pushing on a string, you're trying to punish people with uh, dollar-specific sanctions, and they don't work anymore because no one needs the dollar. We're not there yet, but we're, we're pretty far down that road. So do you think countries like China, Russia, are they dumping uh, treasuries, the dollar? Are they preparing to separate themselves from the dollar? Yes, and the, the, they're doing it several ways. One is reducing their exposure to dollar holdings, not not you know all at once, not dumping them on mass. But if you look at, there's something called the Tick Report, uh, which comes out from the Treasury um, periodic. I think it's once a month, or it's at least quarter quarterly, but uh, whether it's monthly or quarterly, it's, you know, it's available on the Treasury website. And it shows foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. And if you look at the official holdings with the Trump administration, now, just to illustrate that, during the presidential campaign, the 2016 presidential campaign, Trump over and over, you know, railed against China, called China a currency manipulator. He said, you know, when, I'm, when I win, I'm sworn in my day one executive order. We're going to label China currency manipulator. Now, that's not actually how you do it. I mean, they, you can call anyone any, anything you like, but the, the currency manipulation designation comes from the U.S. Treasury. Now, granted, that could be directed by the White House, but it comes to the U.S. Treasury. It, it's actually scheduled for April. Uh, they, there's a, an annual review from the Treasury. It's all laid out by statute, but um, there's no expectation that that's going to happen. So Trump has not followed through on that he's used the rhetoric he actually said germany was a currency manipulator interesting because germany doesn't have a currency they have the euro uh but um so he's throwing the word around but he hasn't actually done anything however trump is dead serious about trade sanctions trade relief and tariffs and the team there you see peter navarro um uh, jim lighthizer the um uh, sir robert lighthizer the uh the u.s trade representative and um, and uh, Wilbur Ross at the uh, uh, Secretary of Commerce, they're the troika on trade. So watch Navarro, Wilbur Ross, and Lighthizer. Um, they're, so they're going to be pushing back against China, not on the currency front, but on the trade front. It'll be interesting to see what happens with uh, uh, President Xi and, uh, and President Trump uh, meeting in uh, Mar-a-Lago um, next week. So we are seeing signs that uh, currency wars are morphing into trade wars. Having said that, uh, the currency wars are alive and well. Uh, they're being fought by central banks through 
uh, either easing or tightening and a lot of flip-flopping in the case of the Fed. I expect that will continue. As far as the kinetic war side of it, um, we may see um, the U.S. attack North Korea. I think that's very likely at this point because North Korea shows no signs of uh, uh, steering away from their um, nuclear program, their their effort to uh, basically take their pl plutonium, highly enriched uranium supplies, weaponize it, ruggedize it, uh, perfect their ICBMs and be able to uh, launch a nuclear strike on Los Angeles and kill several million Americans. So that that's happening. They'll have that capacity within probably four years. Clearly, the United States will not allow that to happen. Uh, and so if, uh, and I don't see North Korea being deterred, so the U.S. will probably have to attack North Korea and there are other hotspots around the world. So I think the sequence of currency wars, trade wars, shooting wars is playing out very much as it did in the 1920s and 30s. You mentioned the United States going into North Korea or doing something with North Korea. Are you talking about an invasion? Or are you talking about some type of covert operation to destroy their nuclear facilities? Because won't this, like you said, it's going to kick off a shooting war. I mean, won't Russia, China, won't they step in or say something about it? Well, um, it won't be an invasion. The last thing anybody wants, I think we learned our lessons in uh uh, Vietnam and the Korean War that, you know, U.S. troops fighting land wars in in Asia is not a good idea. So I think they, the Pentagon's internalized that, but there's no need for that. I think it would be a, a combination of, because uh, war has many dimensions and getting more dimensions all the time as the, as the cyber uh, battle space expands. So I would expect, uh, sure, possibility of, of covert operations, sabotage, assassination, the kind of things that were carried out against the Iranians. Um, but also cyber warfare, which was also carried out against the Iranians, difficult to do, but the ability to penetrate, uh, you know, North Korean uh, computer systems, North Korean payment systems, etc. Uh, but then on the kinetic side, you can just use air power and, and you know, sea-based air power. Uh, we have bunker buster bombs, but you might see tactical nuclear weapons uh, uh, for the first time since um, uh, World War II at Nagasaki and Hiroshima, you might need tactical nuclear weapons to to really destroy the program. You know, it's an old saying in geopolitics, if you're going to kill the king, don't miss. In other words, if you're going to do it, do it. There's nothing worse than an attempted uh, assassination or attempted decapitation where you fail to do the job and end up being on the wrong side of the pushback. So, so again, I wouldn't rule out the use of tactical nuclear weapons in North Korea, but you know, hopefully that wouldn't be necessary. But the third vector, and this is happening now, is financial warfare. And financial warfare is not just, um, uh, you know, sanctions. It, it's actually a form of warfare, but you carry it out through financial means. This is what I actually talked about uh, in, in, in all of my books, uh, the first two chapters of Currency Wars, the first two chapters of The Death of Money, which came out in uh, 2014, New York Times bestseller. Uh, and I touch on it again in, in my most recent book, The Road to Ruin. Uh, but that's already happening. Uh, now, interestingly, we had a very tough regime of economic sanctions against North Korea early in the Bush administration. And they were actually working. The, we were putting the, the North Koreans' backs to the wall. Uh, we had we were frozen assets in an entity called Banco Delta Asia, which was a North Korean uh, front, North Korean intermediary. But we backed off from that. Uh, I'm not sure why we didn't want to push that harder. I don't know exactly what threats might have been made behind the scenes. But we, we got some vague promises from North Korea. But then they, by, by late, by 2006 uh, into 2008, those promises were broken. The Obama administration didn't do anything, as far as I can tell. They just punted on the issue. Uh, and now it's been handed off to Trump. So, um, so again, North Korea shows no signs of backing away from that. But we just recently announced that North Korea was de-swifted. Now, just to explain that term, SWIFT is the uh, Society for Worldwide um, uh, International uh, Financial Telecommunications. It's the it's the, the central nervous system of the global financial system. It's a, a system based in Belgium through which all financial message traffic, not, not all, but almost all important financial message traffic moves. Um, getting kicked out of SWIFT, and that's what we mean by de-swifting, uh, it's like cutting off oxygen to a patient in intensive care. I mean, they're they're basically going to be financially strangled. We just did that to North Korea a few weeks ago, and that's only the second time I've seen that. The first time was Iran um, in uh, in 2012, although that was um, President Obama alleviated that to some extent in 2013 
in exchange for Iran agreeing to discuss uh, nuclear weapons and led to this memorandum, which the Trump administration now seems prepared to tear up. So, And we're also putting sanctions back on Iran again after easing up from 2013 to 2016. We're now back in the business of putting sanctions on Iran. So this is the financial warfare space. So you have a special operations, cyber warfare, financial warfare, and combining the two, cyber financial warfare, uh, and then possibly air power, all designed to uh, either deter or degrade uh, the North Korean nuclear program. Now, you mentioned the SWIFT program, and Russia came out with announcement that they're ready to separate from the SWIFT system. And I know China is also working on a separate payment system. In your view, why are they doing this? Well, because they know it can be used against them, uh, and it is very effective. As I say, it's, you know, like cutting off the oxygen supply uh, is is not uh, not overstating the metaphor, so to speak. Um, but um, look, we've already put Russian... Uh, uh, sanctions on Russia, but there's a financial war going on between Russia and the United States right now. If you were in a war with the United States, you would fight it aggressively and you would make preparations for worse. Uh, your books. And uh, here we are in 2017 and you wrote a book, Currency Wars. And I wanted to know if the currency wars are now over. Has that passed? Are we past that at this point? Uh, they're not over, but they're uh, th they're morphing a little bit, which is one of the uh, things I talked about in the book. The first point I made uh, in the book, Currency Wars, that came out in 2011, um, is that the world is not always in a currency war. But when it is, the currency war can go on for a very long time, meaning 15, 20 years. And I illustrated that with what I call Currency War One, which lasted from 1921 to 1936, uh, starting with the Weimar hyperinflation, uh, the UK's decision to go back to gold at the wrong price, uh, and the beginnings of the Great Depression. Uh, then I, I talk about Currency War Two, which I date from 1967 to 1987, beginning with the... Uh, uh, devaluation of pound sterling and the, the first major break in the Bretton Woods system, and then continuing through the uh, plaza and the Louvre Accord in the in the mid 1980s. And the point is, uh, currency war one lasted 15 years. Currency war two lasted 20 years. Currency war three began in 2010, uh, partly as a response to the um, uh, not just the financial panic of 2008, but the, uh, the the recession, the technical recession, and actually the depression. Uh, that followed. But it uh, here we are in 2017. It's no surprise that seven years later, we're still in this currency war. And I would expect that we'll still be in it two years from now or maybe five years from now because they don't have logical conclusions. It's like a, a, a tennis match, you know, the, the, among equally, you know, talented players. The ball just goes back and forth and back and forth. You know, I devalue, you devalue, I devalue again, you devalue again, etc. Um, they don't have a logical conclusion except for systemic reform, if, if people actually get together, as they did at Bretton Woods in 1944, or as they did in the Plaza Accord in, in 1985 and the Louvre Accord in 1987, and sit down and agree on what international monetary experts actually call the rules of the game. That's not a made-up phrase. Uh, that's, that's shorthand for, you know, how is the international monetary system supposed to work among the major players? That's what people mean when they say the rules of the game. Right now, there are no rules of the game. Uh, but because uh, we're in a currency war. But if you can agree on rules of game, that's one way for currency wars to end. The other way they end is with systemic collapse, where things just spin so out of control that people lose confidence in um, in paper money. They lose confidence in the system. They run to hard assets, uh, gold and silver, obvious ones, but fine art, land, natural resources. Uh, there are many other um, uh, you know alternative assets to to the main currencies. Uh, and that's another uh, another way out. And again, we saw that in um, in the Great Depression. Uh, we also saw it in 1914 at the beginning of uh, World War One when the New York Stock Exchange, for example, was closed for five months. You know, I, I tell people that it's obviously a historical record, but they're shocked to hear that. And, uh, you know, 1933, the banks, all every bank in America was closed by executive order. So we have seen these kinds of extreme responses to financial panics before. So you either have systemic reform or systemic collapse. Uh, I don't see any movement towards systemic reform right now. People talk about it. Uh, maybe they wish it would happen, but uh, there's a lot of denial and a lot of self-interest and a lot of self-satisfaction. So I don't really see that momentum that, that may change, but systemic collapse is definitely in the cards. Having said that, going to the, the specifics of your question, where are we in the currency wars? I also made the point in, in my first book that currency wars lead to trade wars and that trade wars 
end up being shooting wars, uh, kinetic wars. And right now we may, we are seeing definite signs that we're tipping into the trade war phase with particularly